So this is a good point to hand over to, to Andrew. I've had a sneak preview of the slides, and I think this really demonstrates um, how interesting work on understanding how the climate system is working combined with understanding of heat-related mortality. Andrew, over to you. Okay, thanks very much, Jason. I just want to check that uh, that my slides can be seen. Yeah, uh, that's good. Great. Okay. Um, so thank you very much. Um, yes, uh, this is joint work with Cathy Huang, my, my PDRA at Reading and Tingson, and Christoph Saran at the Met Office. Um, so as Jason said, uh, what we're trying to achieve in, in this project is, is to kind of pull through and build evidence and the technological base for a future climate service for health that, that the Met Office would uh, would run. Um, and I think it's, you know, it's very clear that this service is, is needed. So, um, you know, there are many estimates around of, of mortality in the UK that's associated with uh, non-optimal temperatures, uh, cold or, or hot temperatures. Uh, and perhaps that's as much as 9% as of, of total mortality. Uh, and at the present time, that, that's predominantly associated with, with cold weather. Um, but um, obviously, as the climate warms, many studies um, anticipate that the, the mortality associated with hot weather will increase substantially, perhaps doubling or, or tripling by, by 2050. Um, and so um, it's clear that we, we need to uh, incorporate this uh, element of society into any future um, climate service. Um, so as I move through my presentation, I'm going to try and emphasize the new capability and data sets that we've developed as part of this project. And with that in mind, um, one way that the results of this project are going to be disseminated is through the new uh, environmental public health surveillance system that Public Health England and the Met Office are jointly developing. Um, so um, this is currently um, in development and due to be completed by the end of 2020. Uh, and then it, it will be open to, to public health agencies and to other researchers by, by 2021. And it has, um, you know, all sorts of both health and, and meteorological data um, that can be used to, to um, anticipate um, and mitigate risks. So our, our primary tool here for um, assessing the impact of temperature on mortality is, is the distributed lag nonlinear model um, described in detail in uh, this very nice guide. Um, and essentially, this is a statistical tool which links uh, health outcomes to um, exposures and to other confounding effects. So primarily here, we're interested in temperature, of course, but we're also interested in the, the impact of temperature, not just on the day in which um, populations are exposed to, to extreme temperatures, uh, but for some days after that. So I'm not going to go into detail about the model, that there are plenty of references there if, if you want to do that. Uh, but just to say we're fitting this model uh, over 21 days uh, lag from exposure and we're fitting it for the period 1991 to 2018 and we're doing that on a UK regional basis so nine regions in England, Scotland, Northern Ireland and Wales and just so you get a sense of, of uh, the information that the statistical model gives us uh, I'm showing a summary here for, for South East England so this is telling us the cumulative risk, cumulative relative risk um, at a range of different temperatures here on the bottom. Uh, and this has the kind of classic U-shaped um, distribution that, that, um, uh, that is expected for the impacts of uh, temperature on health. So uh, greater risk of, of mortality in this case at very low temperatures and very high temperatures, uh, and with moderately increased risk here in, in these kind of moderately cold conditions. Now, as I said, of course, an important element of this model is, is the um, is the lag between exposure to, to temperature and the impact on mortality. Uh, and it's important to note that on the hot and cold sides here, as again has been widely um, talked about in the literature, there's a, there's a different structure of the impact uh, on, uh, on mortality. So when we have hot temperatures here, the example is, is 22 degrees, we expect increases in mortality risk on the day of exposure and, and just afterwards, uh, and then a, a moderate protective effect and, and very small impact um, uh, after that time. But for cold weather, we expect actually the, the largest increases in risk two to three days after exposure to, to colder temperatures, and then an ongoing uh, impact on mortality, small but ongoing impact on mortality um, in time. And that's why it's important to have this, this distributed lag nonlinear model. <laughs> 
because we have lag in the model, then if, if we're looking to um, associate temperature with mortality on a given day, we have a couple of choices that can be made about how we do that. Um, so one way we, we can do that is to, is to think about so-called forward perspective. So think about the exposure to temperature on a given day and what the cumulative impact on uh, risk and mortality is uh, after that day. So we're gonna call that the forward perspective. Um, or we can think about for a given day, um, how, how, many of, how much of the mortality or other health impacts are associated with exposure to, to adverse temperature over the previous uh, three week period. And we're gonna call that the backward perspective. So as I say, we've, we've fit these models and then done some attribution of uh, mortality for, for all of the different regions of the UK for this period, um, 1991 to 2018. And here's a couple of events where we had elevated mortality uh, associated with uh, adverse temperature. Um, so this is an example uh, cold wave here in uh, December 2010. Uh, and this is a heat wave in, in 2000, August 2003. Um, and so here are the, the temperature uh, traces from Hadj UK grid for the UK average and for the regional average. So you can see we have this very cold period here uh, in December and here's the, the kind of peak uh, in, in high temperatures uh, in August. So if we look at the um, attributed uh, mortality associated with those events, uh, then you can see, uh, as I emphasized before, for the, for the cold weather mortality, there's a really quite significant difference here between the backward and forward perspective. So the cold temperatures that we see here are associated with increases in mortality um, for some time afterwards. But if we're looking at when the peak in mortality associated with cold weather occurred, actually the peak there occurred sometime later associated with this long period uh, of, of cold weather in December. And we also have information on the kind of regional breakdown of that information uh, shown here in the bottom. For, um, for the heat wave conditions, then there's much less difference between the, the forward and backward approaches. Um, so these outputs will all be available from the project. So there will be these regional time series of forward and backward attributable mortality and hospital admissions uh, and linked, um, uh, linked temperature and, and uh, weather regime uh, information, which I'll talk about in a moment. And then if you're just interested in cases where the, the, condition, the mortality conditions were rather extreme, then we also have a, a digest of those uh, extreme events. So as Jason said, an important part of, of the resilience is then thinking about how uh, meteorology affects the, the mortality in the UK. Uh, so we've done that in a couple of ways, looking at weather regimes and weather patterns. Um, so these are ways of describing um, the kind of interesting chaotic variability uh, of the atmosphere, thinking about particular states around uh, which the atmosphere tends to prefer. Um, so for weather regimes, we're thinking about rather long-lived um, event uh, patterns that tend to dominate conditions uh, over the whole North Atlantic. Uh, and we do that by means of these typical four weather regimes. Um, these are 500 hectopascal geopotential height plots uh, shown in the, in the contours and then the anomalies shown in the colours. And so here we have the North Atlantic oscillation uh, negative and positive phases that you might be familiar with. Uh, and then these, these uh, blocking conditions with a, with a ridge in the Atlantic or a ridge over in, in Scandinavia. And we have slightly different regimes here in the summer. What we've also done, because this is a, uh, one way that the Met Office like to look at uh, weather conditions, is to look at uh, the so-called 30 decider patterns. So these are slightly more detailed patterns with a focus very much on conditions that are occurring uh, right over the UK and dominating UK weather. So as an example of, of how we've done some of this analysis, we've looked at um, through the database, um, which are the, are the days with the, uh, which are the, the top kind of 5% days with the highest uh, temperature related mortality. Um, so if we do that for the winter, here are the, uh, the days ranked. Um, and we've colored each of, the, each of the bars here by the weather regime that was occurring uh, on that day. So you can see that very many of um, uh, the days here associated with high mortality are in the NAO minus regime, and some of them in the, in the Scandinavian blocking regime. Um, and then in the summer, we, we have a rather different pattern. So uh, in these cases, it's really the, um, the, the blocking regime here that's associated with days where we have um, uh, larger mortality. Then for the, for the weather patterns, we can get into a bit more detail about the exact kind of weather conditions that affect mortality over the UK. Um, so here I'm showing some examples with um, uh, the, the, the number of days in, the, in this kind of top uh, 
five five percent of cases um, for mortality that occurred in each of these different decider weather patterns uh, for each of the regions here across the UK uh, and for the UK as a whole. Um, and so we can see in the winter, um, it's really these kinds of patterns here associated with the NAO uh, negative pattern with, with slightly different structure, giving slightly different weather over the UK, which are really associated with the uh, with these uh, periods of uh, excess uh, strong excess mortality. Uh, and then in the summer, we have a, a slightly different set of patterns here. And um, so we, there, there are kind of perhaps a number more um, types of conditions which give us um, extreme mortality. So we have some of these summer NAO patterns, but we also have these, these high pressure um, kind of patterns with high pressure over the, over the North Sea. What we also notice when we look at the summer um, is that there are also conditions because of that U-shape um, in, the, in the temperature mortality relationship, there are also colder conditions uh, in the summer uh, where we have um, perhaps unsummer-like uh, weather, where we also tend to find um, that there's periods of enhanced mortality. And they tend to be associated with these kind of patterns with uh, low pressures tracking over the, over the UK. And we started to look a little bit more on that. So just to emphasize, we're kind of in this part of the space here uh, in the summer where there's some elevated mortality because of colder conditions. And you can see that for all of the regions in the UK, there are some periods, you know, a significant um, number of those days with high mortality are actually associated with colder conditions um, in the summer. Thinking on a, a slightly longer time scale, um, there, are, there are other um, reasons why we might expect to have uh, enhanced periods of cold or, or warm conditions uh, over the UK and in Europe. And one of those is, is the occurrence of stratospheric sudden warming events. Uh, so those are major long lasting disruptions to the, the normal polar vortex in the stratosphere that lead to enhanced cold weather over Europe. Um, and why those are interesting thinking about resilience is that, is that those events are, are predictable uh, and, and perhaps have, we have slightly more skill thinking about the subseasonal and seasonal timescales when we have those events occurring. Uh, and by looking at this mortality data series, then we've been able to show that um, thinking about the backward attributable uh, mortality, then there is this um, enhancement of uh, mortality following SSW events. And because of the lag, um, this mortality tends to, to peak three to five weeks after the sudden warming occurs. So there's, there's potential to use these events to, to help us uh, build, build resilience uh, in, in the cold season. So we've also um, thought about how these, these risks might change in the future. So we've been using the UKCP uh, 18 uh, global model simulations. So the 28 global uh, simulations run under RC, RCP 8.5. Um, and essentially what we've done is run, uh, do a little bit of bias correction of the regional temperatures first, and then we've run um, those the, the daily temperature series from those models through our exposure um, response relationships for mortality and for hospital admissions. But we're also a little bit interested in trying to understand different sources of uncertainty in those projections. So obviously there is uncertainty in the climate projections themselves, which is why we look at 28 different global climate models, but there's also significant uncertainty in the temperature mortality or temperature admissions relationships. So we've tried to sample that by doing some Monte Carlo resampling of our model fits uh, and, then, and then looking at how that affects our um, uh, attributable fraction. So here's an example of that process. So the um, combining those two approaches is shown in the, in the red histogram here, looking at the mean uh, forward attributable fraction uh, for the kind of present day, 91 to 2018. Uh, and there's a little bit of variation between the climate models, but obviously the, the, the large part of the uncertainty here comes from uncertainty uh, in, the, in the mortality model fit itself. Then when we look into the, into the future, obviously that uh, uncertainty from the mortality model is, 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 doesn't change largely, um, but we have uh, significantly more um, uncertainty coming from the climate model simulations themselves. And I should say that we're not taking into account other uncertainties here, um, which obviously will be important around demographic change uh, or adaptation of, of the population, so changes to, to vulnerability associated with uh, changes in temperature. So um, I guess our message really is, is very similar to what's already been published in the literature here, as, as you might expect. Um, so here's the kind of mean uh, forward attributable fraction in winter, so it's sort of around 10-12% uh, depending on the region that we're looking at. 
And then as we go into the future, with no changes in demographics and no changes in, in vulnerability, we would expect a, um, a decline, a change in, in the mean uh, fraction of mortality associated with temperature in the winter. Uh, and then if we look in the summer, we're obviously ex expecting that same uh, increase in mortality associated with uh, warming temperatures with really large uncertainty by, by the end of, of, the, of the century. Uh, and th these results are rather, pretty much in line with what's already been, been published in the literature. Um, so just to emphasize that um, these time series of forward and backward attributable uh, mortality fraction uh, for each of the simulations will be available uh, along with the Monte Carlo samples of the, of the simulations uh, for others who are interested in kind of exploring and, and quantifying uncertainty associate, associated with uh, temperature driven mortality. What we're moving on to now is thinking uh, on a slightly smaller scale, so trying to understand um, how these, these events play out on the urban scale. Uh, so we've been thinking particularly of, um, of London uh, and a couple of events in 2018. So 2018 was kind of interesting when we look across the UK, so these are similar plots to the ones I showed before, because we had both a, a very cold spell uh, in March in 2018 and then a, a, a heat wave in July. And these are the, the national uh, pictures here, as, as we've already shown. So we've been starting to look at how um, these events impact uh, hospital admissions in London. And here's the relationship between um, hospital admission, the risk of hospital admissions and, and temperature for London. Um, so obviously, when we think about variation in, in temperature across an, an urban area, then um, th there's lots of kind of complex um, interactions between the meteorology and the urban surface. So to try and account for some of that, we've been using an urban land surface model, Suez, to, um, to try and urbanize some of the meteorology from the HAD UK data set. Um, so this model has a, a kind of complex representation uh, of the urban boundary layer. And so we've been, we've been driving it uh, with uh, data from HAD UK grid to get a, a sense of how temperatures vary across, the, uh, across London um, for these two events. So here's an example of that. Um, so if I start on the right, uh, here's the kind of average temperature over the cold spell and the heat wave. Um, and this is, this is shown by London Borough. Um, and so you can see there really are sort of substantial differences in, in temperature across the, the urban area associated with these events. So uh, perhaps as we would expect, kind of cooler, con uh, warmer conditions in the, in the centre uh, of London and cooler conditions uh, outside. Um, and then a, and a difference of around two degrees, and then a slightly different pattern associated with the heat wave um, uh, with more extreme conditions kind of to the, um, to the, to the, north, uh, to the northeast um, side of London. And then we can use that information and our model for uh, the, the relationship between temperature and admissions um, to try and think about the attributable fraction of mortality, which obviously matches the, the temperature that we're feeding the model, and then to try and think about um, how that plays out in terms of uh, attributed admissions uh, across the city scale. So just as a quick summary then, then the idea is that we're, we're really trying to combine kind of existing epidemiological ideas and models uh, with our best estimates of, of past and future temperatures from, from UKCP. Um, and the result is that we've been able to produce um, kind of lots of data series and model fits that we hope can be used to explore um, the drivers of, of past and future ill health uh, and, and hospital emissions associated with, uh, with temperature. And the aim is to, is to provide those through this new climate service uh, disseminated through EPHSS. And what we hope is that um, by understanding the, the meteorological drivers of the uh, temperature related mortality, then we can kind of improve predicted capacity for these uh, events, impactful events on, on all sorts of timescales. Um, and as we're beginning to see with our work in London, and I think this is also well known, um, the impacts of, of adverse temperature on, on different populations is obviously very different depending on the, the, the vulnerability of those populations to extreme temperatures. Uh, and so in the, in the final phase of the project, uh, we're looking for ways in which we might try to incorporate some of that information. Uh, and we, we've held a recent series of webinars, which I'm sure Mark will, will talk about, uh, talking with um, experts from public health to understand how we might do that. So thanks very much.